And with that, welcome back to empirical methods. <laughs> okay, uh, should I help up? Yes, yes. Yeah. Let's see it. <laughs> you gotta earn it. <laughs> okay, how is uh somebody have questions about the interview protocol scripts? Are you doing okay? Are you lost? Do you have questions? Um I don't like asking this, but honestly, can can you extend the deadline for it? Yeah, sure. How much longer? Um I think it could be end or that like week. End of next week, class Thursday instead of uh, class Tuesday. Or Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. Okay, sure. Yeah, okay, no problem. Anything else? Yeah. Separate question, but I will say that's very helpful. So thank you, Lauren. Um, my question is in the readings, it says at some point that we should during at the beginning of the interview clearly tell the subject uh, who the who the research is being carried out for and mm. what it hopes to achieve. Mm. And so I was thinking as part of our interview script, we're trying to like coax people into figuring out whether they're biased or not. So it seems a little counterintuitive to tell them at first, hey, we're doing this to figure out if you're biased. So, okay, so two comments. Um, this is a great question, by the way. Thank you for raising this. I realized, I guess in between last class and now also that this is a charged topic and therefore possibly hard to ask questions about. Um, uh, two, two comments, one, the purpose of the interview and the research behind it is a class project. That is the truth. There's no point in it's making something else up. If you're doing a class project for empirical methods, and as part of this, you're doing a couple of interviews on this topic. It doesn't have to be something else. I think the real reason is a valid reason. Um, second comment. This may be hard and sensitive, but only depending on what your research questions are. Okay, so you know, I suspect it will be hard to get people to admit they're biased in some socially undesirable ways. So I probably wouldn't even try. It seems like that would be hard. But I would try to get other kinds of information from them that could be useful. Uh, you know, depending on what your research questions are. I don't know what your research question is at the moment. I don't remember what it is. Uh, I don't even know that I know what it is. It is different from the one you had in your lit review. Um, but the point of the interview is to tailor it to the research question you're asking, and that may differ between all of you. You know, you may end up asking some of the same questions, but you can also probably, I would be surprised if you all end up asking the same questions, just because surely there's things you will find differently interesting. So, you know, for example, one thing I suggested in the handout was might be interesting to compare uh, perceptions of these biases and or their magnitude to whatever the empirical data shows later on when we do the quant analysis. But it's not that, you know, uh, here, it's not that you're making the people feel bad for being biased themselves. But you're sort of gauging general perceptions of these biases or their own perceptions of these biases, for example, right? You know, obviously they're not the ones that are biased, right? But, you know, maybe they have an opinion of how these biases go or how strong they are or whatever else, you know, maybe of interest to you depending on your questions. And later on, you come back and say, look, you know, you were right, or it's actually 10 times worse than you thought, or in fact, there's nothing there, you know, if you look at the the empirical evidence, the data. So th that's one possible avenue to take this forward, you know, perception versus, or belief versus evidence. There could be lots of others. I, I, I don't want to prescribe this. I want you to do something that's interesting to you all. Uh, but obviously, you know, like you, if you want to get at how biased the people themselves are, you'll have to probably be somewhat clever in how you get at this. Maybe potentially even deceptive. I'm not sure, right? So that may be difficult. Um, don't make it too difficult, but yeah, certainly I'm, I want to see what you all come up with. Like, I, this is kind of it's the first time I'm doing this in this format. Last year we had a different theme for the interviews, so it's also a little bit new for me. Right? Kind of how far we could take this. You know what the um, uh, grand challenges of, of 
getting information out of people are. Uh, I'm also learning a bit as we go along. Cool, thank you. Has anybody done any interviews? Have you settled on a question? Maybe, no? Okay. One of the questions we had come up with originally or susceptible to the like, you, you can't directly ask about bias sort of thing. So we had to like kind of restructure our questions to help what people's different opinions of like the structure of the um, evaluations are or like uh, if they if they thought there was bias here. Um, another idea, is, thanks for this, uh, another idea that just comes to mind now, um, possibly also very interesting later on when we do the quant analysis to try to model some of these moderating factors. You know, maybe there is an average bias in some direction, but maybe in the right kind of context or environment or whatever, you know. Um, so for example, I've read in some of your attributes, sorry for not finishing grading those yet, um, that the uh, composition of the department that is offering these courses and how uh, demographically balanced or diverse that is versus unbalanced, that has an impact on um, you know, the presence of these biases and these sports. So you know, for example, you could use the interviews to maybe uh, elicit some ideas for moderating variables like that, and that we could later on test hypotheses about them when we look at the actual data in a couple of weeks or so. So, you know, just a few ideas of things to, to try to do in the space. Um, feel free to talk to me more, you know, over Slack or email or in person in TCS if you are unsure or want more feedback or just are kind of doubts about whether you're on the right track. But I, I am myself curious to see what you will come up with. This is an open-ended research question also for me, kind of how far we can push this. Okay, so two things for today that I'd like to do. One is, I'd like to talk about the other half of uh, this discussion of qualitative interviews. We talked about you know how we collect the data and hopefully we learn some tips for how to do that in a more rigorous, robust way. Uh, and we're going to talk next about what we do with that data once we have it. I guess ask ChatGPT to analyze it is one option, but you know, assuming we don't do that, uh, what else could we do ourselves? By the way, this sunrise this morning, wild. Um, this is from this morning. Um, and hopefully we have some time towards the end to actually do some qualitative analysis hands-on together. I have some example transcripts of interviews from a previous research study that I think uh, Jim Herzlev and colleagues did a few years ago on people's participation in corporate hackathons. You know, why people signing up for some, I don't know, Microsoft hackathon or something. Uh, and they have a bunch of interviews and transcripts asking, uh, among others, you know, what people were trying to get out of this experience and whatnot. We can do some analysis in class um, to try to understand, you know, build some theory about why people are participating in corporate hackathons. That's hopefully the plan. Hopefully we have time to get there. Does that make sense? Okay. Oops. Um, right. In our, so there's a lot of stuff. Again, I'm trying to condense here. I picked out some things that I thought were worth mentioning in, in a group setting, but as always, please go and, and look at these things, or at least remember to look at them when you have to um, do some of this work yourselves. They're all in the shared folder that you have access to under qualitative analysis. Uh, all of the chapters and whatnot that I'm stealing from, I copied there so you can find them easily. Um, okay, and I'm largely following chapter four from this uh, book today. So um, you have done a bunch of interviews. Um, I don't know, between all of you, you've done like 30, 40 interviews. And now we have this pile of, let's say text, let's say we have the transcripts from all of these interviews. The question is, 
what do we do with all of this pile of textual data and how do we make science out of this? Um, how do we go from journalism to more robust, bigger science from this pile of data? So th this is going to be conceptually very easy, I uh, assert, but practically very hard to do once you get to do this for real. Um, so keep an open mind for you know, how easy, deceptively easy this will seem at first glance and sort of how tricky you will, you will get when you, when you do this for real later on. First step is to summarize, to abstract, to condense all of this data. Um, and we call this step coding usually. You think of this as labeling. Codes, codes is a technical term. Think of them as labels. We're summarizing this pile of text by labeling it, by coding it. Uh, we're gonna talk about kind of different ways to do this. Uh, basically as a way to abstract and to help us navigate this high volume of data, just to make it smaller. And the second step is, the most interesting and the hardest one is making sense of all of these now uh, codes and some reason labels, if you will, is finding patterns among these. Um, and this is when we go from the raw data to some hopefully theory uh, in the best case. This is also where this term grammar theory is where you'll hear this a lot. Um, it's basically the step that allows us to interpret uh, what we're seeing and to build these uh, actions and, and ultimately theory from it. Okay. So conceptually very simple, right? Step one is organize the data essentially by coding it. Step two is interpret and organize those codes, uh, come up with themes, build a theory, whatever it may be. Okay. So now let's see kind of how we do all of this. So first part, coding, there's different ways in which you can do this, different purposes of this uh, activity. Um, for example, maybe the most basic one is to um, just describe what the person was talking about, kind of in, as succinctly as possible. So here the quote, the transcript says something like, as I walked toward the school, there were there was a 7-Eleven convenience store one block away next to a small professional office building, an optometrist, podiatrist, blah, blah, blah. Directly across the street was an empty lot, but next to that stood a Burger King restaurant. The person here talks about businesses that happen to be on their commute or something like that. Okay. So, you know, it's a way to kind of navigate, to organize the, the raw text. Maybe the individual specifics don't matter, but sort of what the person is talking. There's this technical term you will hear or see in papers called in vivo. Um, so the idea here is that you create, oh, by the way, so one, uh, one other commentary. Assuming for now, for the sake of this discussion, that these codes, these labels don't exist a priori. Okay, you're sort of, as you're, going through this pile of text that you have collected, you are both summarizing it and coding it, as well as creating these codes as you're doing that. They don't exist ahead of you. Could you imagine, side, could you imagine a scenario where you have all of these codes or labels ahead of time, and you're going through the pile of text trying to, I don't know, match text to the code you already have? Would that make sense? When would that make sense? Why? Somebody other than Kaya, Kaya is awake today. Let's see, not sure, Ben? Uh, Ian, sorry. Uh, maybe you hypothesize a set of codes? Yes, good Good intention, good idea, Elizabeth. Maybe you have some specific type of theory that you're trying to see as true in some context. That's really it. Okay, so we're back to square one. We're back to, you know, are we building theory fundamentally as the goal of this activity, or are we testing theory fundamentally as the goal of this activity? Okay, so, you know, if that's the case, if you have this pre-existing theory and hypotheses and what have you, um, maybe you've done some preliminary interviews and you already have some, you know, theory fragments and you have a code book 
that's another technical term code book for this set of codes. We're gonna see what that looks like in a minute. Um, and then maybe do some new interviews, right? You can see, you know, to what extent um, what you're learning from these new interviews matches what you've heard already before. You know, we're back to this point uh, from last class, also of theoretical saturation, right? So this is a way of seeing that you're learning new things so that you're hearing the same things over and over again, right? To the extent to which uh, new codes emerge as you're doing this activity is evidence that you're learning something new, that you haven't quite reached saturation yet. But to the extent that you're seeing the same things again would be indicating uh, indicative of saturation. Okay, so now back to the point, um, to the story. You know, you you create these codes as you go along. Here, um, the in vivo uh, codes are literal quotes from the text you are you are analyzing. Okay, so here, the person says, "I hated school last year. Freshman year was awful. I hated it." So you know, so hated school becomes a label, you know, for this fragment of text, for example. Right, you're pulling something directly from the original source. Okay. Um, and, and so on and so forth. So you can do this by pulling literally quotes from the uh, original text. So that's in vivo coding. Um, you could code for processes you know, that could be from what you're looking for as you're coding. Um, so for example, the quote here is, well, that's one problem that my school is pretty small. So if you say one thing to one person and then they decide to tell two people, oh, it sounds like great gossip. <laughs> <laughs> then those two people tell two people and one period everybody else knows exactly that, it's gossip. Uh, everybody in the entire school knows that you said whatever it was. So um, spreading rumors, sort of the process that is being described by the uh, participant here, coding for, for the process. Um, okay. and. You know, usually you use uh, ing verbs uh, when you're when you're doing this, or you know you could be coding for emotions. You know that's important how people feel about a certain topic. Um, be coding for emotions. I just hated it when this other person got awarded with a distinguished paper award at some conference that they published at. I mean we're praising mediocrity now. Never mind that their paper isn't worth squat. It's all about who they know in the Google Voice Network and the scientific community. Okay, so you know, the participant here is bitter. That could be a code you create and assign to this. Or you can use an in vivo code to say you know, they hate it. And you're pulling directly a code from the origin source. Um, or you know, similarly, you could be coding for values and attitudes uh, and beliefs um, and, you know, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to read this. Uh, Again, if you sort of get the idea, you uh, code for different kinds of things and you go through all of your transcripts by hand yourselves and you assign all of these codes. You know, if you're doing this on paper, you literally mark them up. If you're doing this with some software, you use that, you assign labels and whatnot. Um, there's something called Atlas TI or Atlas.ti that's often being used for coding. You could do Google Docs, you could do whatever works for you, it doesn't really matter. Um, but if you, know, you can use computers to help with this, you can use an LLM presumably to help with this, we're gonna see if that works at all, um, or you can do this on paper. But this is sort of the first step, is coding to organize this data that, um, that you have collected. Um, okay, we talked about this actually just a couple of minutes ago. Revisional coding is when you start from some start list of uh, maybe researcher generated codes and you revise and expand and delete and whatever else is needed as you go along and, and you read through more transcripts. So that's also something that can happen. Uh, and we talked about when that would happen. Okay. Um, Right, this is maybe uh, another sort of example of that. When you start with some uh, pre existing theory and you're looking for evidence specifically to test some hypothesis. So, you know, look how you can think of testing or validating hypotheses also through this sort of qualitative research method, not necessarily using statistics or something like that, hypothesis testing, which is the more common use of the term. 
Um, okay. So we talked about that. So, all right. So some summary considerations here on on the process of coding. It can be deductive versus inductive. Okay, so deductive. Remember we talked about deductive objectivist worldview versus inductive subjectivist. That's sort of the same idea here. Deductive. You start with these things. You know they come from somewhere. They come from the theory. They come from prior work. They come from previous interviews. Whatever it may be, you start from this. And you see to what extent your new data matches uh, this thing you start from, or the other way around. You don't have a theory yet. You build one. You start from scratch and you generate these as you go along. It's deductive versus inductive. Um, right. This this is actually quite important. So it's inevitable. I think you um, you'll find this intuitive. It's inevitable that as your reading and trying to abstract what you're seeing in these transcripts, you're basically interpreting at, at the same time. It's, it's very hard to just you know, simply uh, abstract without you know, implicitly interpreting at all, I think. It's hard to separate the two. Maybe if there's different people doing these two activities, but it's very hard. Um, so really, this is actually a strength, not a weakness, because it helps you identify uh, holes in your argument or your theory or your data or what have you. This is also why uh, the best practice is to start coding and therefore inevitably interpreting the data you're collecting before you do all of the interviews. You know, let's say you want to do I don't know, tens of interviews. The best practice is, is to start looking and thinking about what people have said already as you're, you know, after you've done the first few, uh, because that will shape how you do the next however many, right? Because it will help you identify things that maybe you should have asked differently. You know, you can see once you're looking at the transcripts more carefully that people misunderstood you or it was very hard to get whatever information from them, or that instead you should have asked them different kinds of questions. You learn all of these things and you adjust your protocol and you go back to your next few interviews with an improved version of this and, and more insights. Uh, and you know, this way you get more out of it and so on and so forth. You iteratively switch between collecting more data and you know, coding and interpreting it uh, as you're doing this. This is actually recommended. Um, okay. Um, so, I don't know, if you're like me, a quantitatively inclined person, that likes to measure things, you may complain that this is all very subjective. Um, and you know, how can I trust any of any of this if it's all so inherently subjective? And you know, is there any hope to do any sort of rigorous science? Or what what is the standard of rigor for something that is fundamentally so subjective? One uh, useful thing to do, and I'll show you more tips throughout the, the class today. Um, is to have very clear operational definitions for all of these codes that you're developing, if that's the case, um, and to you know revise and stick to those as you're coding more and more of this data. Um, it's useful for yourselves to be consistent. You know, ultimately, uh, there is no right or wrong here because it really is subjective interpretation. Um, and it's you know, people's experiences and, and whatnot, opinions um, that you're analyzing. There are even right or wrong, but consistency is important. So for example, if um, I um, look at the same transcripts that you have collected, or if a you know, classmate looks at the same transcripts you have collected, and they read very different things in the same data that seem incompatible or inconsistent with the things you have read in the same data. That would be very strange and worrisome. So you know, at least in that sense, having clear operational definitions of here's when, here are what instances of this code look like, and you know, here's when something kind of fits into this code and when it doesn't, having all of those spelled out helps not only you, but it helps with um, consistency and credibility overall in this. We're going to talk more about the standards of rigor in a few minutes. Um, okay, so now another thing you could ask, 
is uh, what's the right level of granularity here? Like, you know, ultimately every other word maybe, except for the, I don't know, prepositions that aren't interesting or something. Most words can be codes by themselves because you know, they mean something. Um, or, you know, the whole transcript can be a code by itself. Like, what is the right level of granularity and how much can you and should you fit into any single code? So, you know, basically, um, there is no silver bullet here. There's no magic answer. The idea is to stick to your original research questions. So that, that gives you a lens that through which to filter out parts of these transcripts that may not be relevant, may not talk about things that are in scope for your research question at all. So that is a, a free pass for you to skip those parts entirely. You just simply don't code them at all. Um, and, and otherwise, you know, any, any block of text can be a candidate for one or multiple uh, codes at the same time. Um, and it's sort of, you know, this is where, uh, in theory, this is all very simple. And kind of when you do this for real and you try to get a good paper out of it, um, it becomes uh, somewhat of an art, not just a science, and, and becomes harder in practice. Okay, so that was coding. Here's an example, um, Courtney Miller, uh, whom many of you should know, he's in our program. He was the first author on the study that we did a couple of years ago. Um, trying to make sense of conversations on the GitHub platform. And she was interested in how toxicity manifests itself in these kinds of conversations. So as part of this study, she was uh, coding and analyzing all of these discussions. And this is a screenshot of uh, our conference table in one of our offices at the time when you know, we would be discussing these different codes uh, as she was doing this work. You can see how she had these all printed out and, you know, she was using highlighting and posted notes and whatever else uh, as one example of how somebody did this for real. You know, you can use software again, you can do this on paper. It doesn't really matter how you do this, Wh whatever makes sense for you. But this is sort of what this process looked like for her at the time. Um, and as part of the same study, she uh, wrote down and maintained this code book. So here you can see examples of the different codes on the left hand side or in the second column, first and second column. Uh, and you can see clear operational definitions for these, you know, what does the code actually mean? Um, and she would go back and forth between the original text and this code book and definitions to uh, convince herself that whatever she was seeing was or was not an instance of these codes that she had defined before. Okay, so you know, she kept maintaining and, and refining this as she went along. Okay, any thoughts on, on this part? Sounds good. So next step is the harder and most interesting part. That's the making sense of all of this uh, set of codes now uh, and accompanying uh, quotes. So there's various reasons or, or goals of, of this. Mm, the most common, maybe the most basic, is to just characterize or categorize the kinds of things that you see. Uh, themes is another technical term here. Is, you know, what are the themes emerging from this data that you've collected from this bunch of interviews. You know, what is it that people tend to talk about? Uh, and those themes obviously, you know, need to have some mapping to your original research questions. There could be other things that are out of scope that you don't talk about. So that could be, that's maybe the most common and the most basic end point for this analysis step. Is it coming up with a set of themes and presenting and organizing and discussing those in a research paper. And that, that's basically, a, so we talked about various kinds of theories. This is maybe the simplest one. So descriptive, you're describing what you're seeing and you're organizing it in some way, you're categorizing it, maybe it's a taxonomy, just themes, whatever. So you're organizing the kinds of things people talk about 
um, in a way that abstracts and finds some commonalities so that, you know, it's not just individual people, but sort of more common themes that recur about, uh, across multiple. Okay. That's the most common and the simplest. And then it can get um, progressively more complicated, uh, maybe more interesting, I'm not sure. Um, as you're really going from this descriptive taxonomy style output to an actual theory that has, you know, causes and effects and uh, mechanisms and, and so on, uh, you know, which you you can do, maybe that's the goal of, um, of the study, maybe you're happy to end earlier, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, but as you're um, going deeper and deeper into interpreting this data, you start to build this theory and to, you know, maybe reason causally about relationships among concepts and people and whatever else. Um, all right, so I'm stealing this diagram from a paper there by Brown and Clark, um, where they describe these phases of thematic analysis. I'm going to talk about this thematic analysis of basically uh, characterizing the data that you have collected um, as maybe the most basic kind of qualitative analysis that you could do. So I'm going to talk about this uh, in, in a bit more detail. And they talk about these different phases. We've done the first few. You've generated these initial codes. And now you're at the step where you're searching for themes. You may want to review them, uh, and then define and name them and organize them and write, write them up in a report, uh, ultimately in a paper. Um, so here's again, coming back to Courtney's study. Um, she used a process called card sorting to make sense of these different codes. The input to this process were every posted note here is a code. Yes, possibly. Every every stack of quotes, so, you know, every little sheet of paper here is an original quote that had been coded with some codes from her original data. Every stack of these, these are organized by the different codes she had assigned. Uh, and now you know you have them all spread out on a big table or something. And literally, as the name implies, you're doing card sorting. You're trying to make sense of this now mess of codes and organize them into some structure that emerges organically as you're doing this. So um, in her case, that structure is represented there on the left. So for example, um, the, some of the low-level original codes could be grouped into these emerging themes. You know, so some of them are about the author of those messages. You know, what kinds of different kinds of authors of those toxic messages were there, uh, and what kinds of triggers for this toxic comment, you know, were there present. Note how I'm saying different kinds, not different instances of. Right. So we're already kind of. Um, aggregating one one level higher, um, and, and so on and so forth. So the idea here is to iteratively and collaboratively, usually, this was a process that involved multiple researchers, you know, together, sitting in a room and kind of going back and forth, you know, to what extent are these things um, maybe the same, you know, could, could we condense two codes into one code that kind of encompasses both? Um, could be how can we group them in a way that makes sense? You know, how what is this emerging structure uh, that comes out of this data um, as we're looking at it? Okay. So the idea is to now again to summarize the idea is to organize the codes into some structure um, and hierarchy, if you will, um, and these top level categories that emerge out of this are so called themes, and that that is a technical term. Now going back to going back to her code book, you can see how, in addition to the set of codes that she came up with and their operational definition, you see also mapped here, you know, kind of grouped into the, these emerging themes. This step here, this grouping of codes into themes, is something that happened as a result of this card sorting process um, in this second step. So, you know, again, you could argue, 
rightfully, that there's more than one way to find patterns among these different codes. Absolutely. So let's look at an example. Consider these codes related to the first month of withdrawal symptoms described by somebody who was participating in a smoking cessation treatment program. So stopping to smoke um, and withdrawal symptoms associated with, with that. These, these were the first level codes after analyzing the transcripts from an interview study with participants in this program. And things like anxiety, nervousness, restlessness, deep breathing, throat burning, felt like crying, hurt someone bad, angry, eating a lot, eating a lot more, wandering around, habitual movements, memories of smoking, and smelling new things. How could you organize these? What might some themes be here? Motions Motion together. So things like anxiety. And nervousness. And so on. Sorry, I missed the comment. Oh, like physical sensations. Yeah. Uh huh. Physical sensations. Like eating a lot more or? Yeah, like throat, throat, like throat burning, telling me things, uh, habitual movements. Throat burning. Being the mechanism. I'm not sure if that's what we've been talking about, for example, on smelling new things. Um, um, so I'm not a smoker. I'm guessing uh, that means they can start smelling new things that they couldn't smell before, maybe. No. So maybe, I don't know, smoking um, inhibited their sense of smell to some extent. Now that they don't smoke anymore, they can start smelling new things. I'm guessing. Benefits or something like that. More ideas? More, more ways of grouping, different ways of grouping. Maybe actions, like hurt someone bad or eating a lot more. Okay, so I think you'll agree that there's more than one way of organizing things. So how, what's the right way? How do you do it? Which one do you choose? Would it be based off of what you're trying to learn? Definitely. Right? That's the number one guiding force behind this. So, you know, what is your research question? What is the goal of the study? What are you trying to get out of this? Right? That drives, what is the theory, if anything? Maybe you're testing something. Um, but that is a great guiding force. Any other thoughts? Do you think it's better to have structure to where it's rare that things are in multiple categories? Um, yes. Uh, I think generally, yes. Um, Yes, I would guess that these have to be mutually exclusive largely because otherwise, how do you decide which group they're in? Or I guess you put them in multiple groups. It feels murkier. Mm -hmm. but it seems cleaner to me to make some decision about kind of what fits where. Um, be very explicit about that. 
right? You, you know, explicit about that. That's why you have these operational definitions and, and so on, and you maintain them and you write them down so that you yourselves, the researchers, can do this consistently and so that others that look at maybe the same data or reviewers to your paper or what have you, they uh, can see how you arrived at those conclusions. They can, they can follow your reasoning. So I guess that's why it's helpful to sometimes code one like sentence as multiple points. Because then you can remove that ambiguity. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, I also use choose these patterns based on trade-offs between specificity and generality when you're making instructions. You want to make sure that it doesn't it's not so specific that it only applies one time. Uh -huh. It's not so general that it encompasses much of the data. Because then you can't really say much about it. It's kind of like that math axiom what it applies to any everything that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, that is a great point, right? So if you have one theme that captures everything not very interesting, you haven't learned too much. Um, and then if you're, if the things within each theme are very incoherent, incohesive, what's the, what's the antonym? If the theme is not cohesive, um, it's also, you know, it's also a little bit weird, you know, when you're reading this paper, because then why is the theme? Why, why have you uh, organized and sort of extracted that, theme out of these things that are seemingly unrelated. By the way, we're going to talk, lots more examples to come of how to report on this in, in papers and whatnot, how to do this most rigorously. Uh, but one worth mentioning here, quotes from the original data are invaluable. So you know, as you're describing your findings and describing these themes and whatnot, and what people talked about, you should always try to substantiate those descriptions that are reporting with original quotes from the original participants, you know, usually anonymously, um, substantiating the points you're making. So I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen papers or I've reviewed papers where the author's description of the theme and the characterization and whatnot when compared to me to the quotes they were using to illustrate that theme seemed very incompatible right so to me the quotes were talking about something completely different as i was reading them than you know then the authors were using to, to argue their case for a particular theme right? so that, that that's usually a bad sign that you know something if if it seems incompatible right what they're claiming with what the original quote is usually a bad sign. Okay, so quotes are really useful to increase the credibility of these studies, qualitative studies, um, because it allows people to actually see, re readers allows them to actually see what the original sources said, not just what you thought they said or, or how you interpreted what they said. Um, and you know, ideally the, the, the two align and match. Um, okay, so here's a couple of examples of ways in which um, one could organize these codes into different themes. Um, you know, we could we could argue about the uh, relative strengths and weaknesses of these, and we could keep reorganizing them and so on and, and, until they make more, more sense. Okay. Okay, so now. This part, the next one still. So let, let's say let's say you've done some work and you have categorized your codes and therefore the original transcripts into these emerging themes. Um, you're in a good place. Right? There's some two, at least two layers of abstraction that you've gone through by now. Um, this is the third one still, is when you're trying to put together these different themes and relationships between them uh, and, and the corresponding concepts. So here um, you could see a snippet of actually looking for explicit relationships and pathways and maybe causal links between some of these concepts that are emerging um, as themes from the previous steps. So this feeling of regretful loss here manifests itself like felt like crying or something, which 
maybe triggers anxiety uh, and that in turn uh, results in comfort and camaraderie. You can see how people are arguing based on the original codes and themes, these possible pathways, and therefore building this you know, slightly more sophisticated theory uh, that also argues about relationships, makes predictions, et cetera, rather than just stops at characterizing, categorizing the original data into you know, emotions and processes and uh, bodily, whatever, physical sensations and whatever else, right? You could have stopped there and just categorized the data. Here, they're going one step further and they're looking for connections between these things, possible causal connections, relationships between them. Uh, and they're arguing how these things might uh, you know, might be related and might influence each other. What's the word to the right of network at the top? Uh, just wondering. Yeah. Display. Um, okay, so now this is all nice and I'm making it seem a lot simpler and cleaner than it is. If you actually start reading some of the debates going on, um, you or depending on how educated your reviewers or pedantic your reviewers are on qualitative research, you can get into really serious arguments with people over uh, how much you're doing grounded theory or what it is you're doing and how correctly and incorrectly you're doing it. This is one, I, I pulled this quote from a paper um, called What Grounded Theory Is Not. I thought it was a great, great quote. Grounded theory is often used as a rhetorical slate of hand by authors who are unfamiliar with qualitative research and who wish to avoid close description of, or illumination of their methods. More disturbing perhaps is that it becomes apparent when one pushes them to describe their methods that many authors hold some serious misconceptions about grounded theory. So basically the idea is that everybody doing, uh, you know, interview studies and qualitative analysis or whatever was claiming that they were doing grounded theory. Um, and the people that are very serious about grounded theory are very serious about what it takes to actually do grounded theory. For one, it takes all of this extra step of actually building this theory with relationships and whatnot between constructs. Um, and most often, people just don't go that extra step. They don't go the whole way. So lots of arguments, uh, you know, that's not grounded theory, you stop too early, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, don't claim uh, you're doing something or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, this is where this grounded theory light idea uh, came from. There's a really nice paper, same paper that argues, you know, just in, instead of claiming that you're doing grounded theory when most often you're not, because you're not going this extra mile of really building theory with relationships and predictions and, and so on, just call it what it is, call it thematic analysis, right? So let's, you know, let's call it something that doesn't quite imply as much, uh, and then readers and reviewers won't be as upset about uh, the kinds of things you're uh, not doing in these papers. Uh, grounded theory increasingly used in a way that is essentially grounded theory light, set of procedures for coding data very much in thematic analysis. They don't appear to fully subscribe to the theoretical commitments of a full fat grounded theory, which requires analysis to be directed towards theory development, right? So you stop at describing the themes uh, without doing this uh, extra theory development. So just call it, call it by that name. So one important bit of information to remember from today's class is that Maybe if you don't go the extra the whole way to articulate really a full full fat theory, um, just don't call that thing grounded theory that you're doing. Call call it thematic analysis. It's totally okay to say you're doing thematic analysis in a research paper, especially in a CS field that uh, you know rarely does this kind of work. Yes. Um, the other impression I got 
like a little bit in the seminar class that we took, but also just through talking to people who do qualitative uh, research, is that like you don't do grounded theory unless there's like no research at all in the area. Um, so like even if you are adding on to or like building theory, like it's people get very touchy if you call something grounded theory if you had prior hypotheses at all and like. Yeah, it's unclear if there are a lot of things that can be called for <laughs> Right. So it's maybe the better advice for your papers, especially in something like software engineering or a CS field, um, just don't claim you're doing run in theory unless you're sure you really are. You're better off, you're better off claiming something like thematic analysis. Um, it will make people less angry. Uh, if, you know, if they really care about this, it will make them less angry when this year paper. Okay, so very pragmatic advice for your submissions. Um, okay. Oops. Um, so one other thing worth mentioning, as part of doing all of this, you can Hopefully see by now that say, you know, on the one hand you have a pile of interview transcripts. And on the other hand, on the other hand, at the other end of this, you have a neatly written research paper with something, a very clean story. You could hopefully see that it's very hard to go from one to the other in, in one pass. So, you know, to help with your sanity and the credibility and of your conclusions and findings, this idea of analytic memoing is highly recommended. It's basically write stuff down as much as possible as you're doing all of these different steps. Keep memos um, of how your analysis has been progressing throughout the different steps, going from raw transcripts to neatly written story in the paper. Um, and this should reflect your thinking process about the data, you know, wh why you ended up coding in a certain way, why you, you ended up deciding that codes can be grouped into those themes and the way they were and, and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, ideally uh, have actual hypotheses and assertions and propositions more like you know, theory, theory-like things um, in these memos that you're keeping for yourselves. So, you know, for example, um, you could have broad descriptive assertions um, about the data that you've, you've been coding. Here, maybe a note that I could have written is, overall, the participants seemed engaged with the uh, code assistant tool. You know, we talked about this coding assistant um, AI tool a few weeks ago. Um, and maybe I did some interviews with users of these, uh, this tool, and I, I write down that they seemed engaged, you know, as one kind of note to myself you know, as I was coding uh, through these transcripts. But they could also be higher level things and interpretations. Uh, so for example, um, having pull requests rejected can be demotivating for contributors already demoralized by low self-confidence in their programming expertise. And this is a hypothesis, an assertion, a proposition that I, the researcher, arrived at, I came up with this by abstracting and interpreting this data from the interviews. The person didn't tell me this explicitly, right? But I sort of, you know, interpreted this by piecing together different bits of evidence that maybe they, they told me, or by contrasting the things and findings between different participants in, in different interviews. I, but you know, this is something that comes to my mind as I'm interpreting and reading this, and I write this down, and I keep track of it, and I keep sort of doing this. Um, and the point is that all of these notes will then kind of help form this emerging uh, theory that you will hopefully eventually arrive. So here's one example of what that looked like from the same study. Um, we had this shared Google uh, spreadsheet in which each of us, so there's a notes, Christian, Bogdan, and Courtney, so we work together on this. Um, and you know, for each 
item that we coded, we each kept a memo of the things we learned or saw or whatever, you know, in that, uh, in that fragment. And we use um, eventually all of these to arrive at the grand theory we arrived at when we, when we told the story as reported in the paper. Okay, but there's a way in which we were memoing um, what we were learning as we were doing synopsis. What, what are uh, what, what, what abbreviations COM, LOCK, COC? Uh, on the left, DL. Uh, um, okay, yeah. So these ones have to do with how we sample the things we coded. So they're not relevant for the purpose of this discussion, but there are different ways in which we collected the original data. This was not interview data. They were online discussions. Um, and these are different ways in which we have sampled um, the uh, discussions we ended up coding and analyzing. And we kept track of this here, you know, in this memo, because we suspected that the nature might be different depending on the source, actually. So, you know, we just kept track of this to see if we're seeing anything uh, of that sort as we were doing the analysis. I see. Okay, so now um, I want to walk you through a very practical set of guidelines and tips for establishing trustworthiness in your own qualitative research. I'm again stealing from this book. Um, and you know, these are things that hopefully you can just directly take and apply to your own work. So some sources of analytic bias, mostly uh, fallacy, finding patterns when there aren't any, seeing things that, see, seeing things that aren't there, elite bias, Maybe you're overweighing the opinions of some high status informants and you're downweighing that of lower status people. Personal bias of yours, the researcher going into the analysis with some ideology or what have you. Going native, losing your outsider objective perspective uh, and lots of others. So we're going to talk about this notion of confirmability as a goal to strive for with qualitative research. With quantitative research, we often talk about validity. I think the more common technical term for qualitative research is confirmability rather than validity. You know, because there is no right or wrong, really, in, in a similar way. It's harder to argue that. They're all valid opinions. But to what extent can we confirm the findings of your study um, if we were to look at the original data ourselves with you know, a different set of eyes, for example? This is more of the goal here. Uh, right, so this is concerned with establishing that your interpretations are clearly derived from the data, the original data, rather than made up, which is a very big threat, something inherently subjective. Um, and it serves to demonstrate how your conclusions and interpretations have been reached. There are three dimensions to this uh, credibility. transferability and dependability. So, you know, as you're reading qualitative research papers or as you're writing your own qualitative research papers, you could look at you know, the better papers will be explicit about possible threats to the credibility or the transferability of the, or the dependability of their findings. 
um, and explicit about steps they took to mitigate those. People will have been very deliberate um, about reducing these possible threats. In your own papers and work, it's helpful to be aware of these, and you know it's helpful to be explicit about the things you did to mitigate these. But I'm going to go through all of them one by one. Okay, so let's start with credibility. One of the uh, one of these. So the idea is that the credibility of a study is determined when others. Um, that are confronted with that same experience can recognize it. As I was giving you this example before of looking at original quotes the authors had pulled uh, and the claims they, their interpretation, the claims they were making, and how I, I felt that they don't align at all sometimes. So, you know, this is, this is that. Do I recognize um, this experience um, as reported, as described by the authors? Okay, so here are some strategies to increase the credibility of qualitative research studies. Um, I'm going to talk about all of these one by one. I think. So, first up, prolonged engagement. So this basically says, don't be shallow, don't be, don't hurry, spend enough time collecting data from the people you're talking to and spend enough time analyzing it and thinking about it um, and interpreting it. So, you know, common misconception in CS students uh, when it comes to qualitative research is oh this is easy you just do a couple of interviews uh what's should be super easy and super quick what's hard about this you know i could do this in a in a, in a week and i have a paper um probably not a very good paper so the idea is that you know the, the more you put into it the more you'll get out of it in terms of you know, richness of uh, interpretation and findings uh, okay one common Threat here, there's this notion of author and effect. Has anybody heard of this? This idea that people's behavior changes when they know they're being observed. Right? So, you know, they put mites in all of our offices. So now, you know, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna behave differently. Right, because I know that I'm being observed. I don't think I've heard of like all this, but I, I think I remember seeing something about how like after I think after the the like the like Edward Snowden stuff, like visits to like certain Wikipedia pages decrease, but, like mostly those like like Wikipedia pages associated with like terrorism or something like decreased because people thought the government was going to like get, like get them for it or something. I'm, I'm thinking of this in a sort of research context where participants in a study might behave differently when they know they're being observed. Um, so the idea of prolonged engagement in this context is to just wait long enough because eventually people will revert back to their true selves and they will eventually forget the fact that they're being recorded or what have you. And they'll behave in, in sort of natural ways eventually, even if they may behave unnaturally in the beginning, artificially, because they think they're being, they know they're being observed. Um, but you know, with enough time, they will sort of tell you how they really feel and, and so on. So that's this idea here, right? Um, you know, maybe I am very cautious in my office and I, you know, don't say anything bad and whatever else in the beginning because I know I'm being observed, but eventually I forget about this and I don't care anymore uh, and I just behave the way I do. So the same with, with research participants. This is interesting. I was curious about this, so I looked this up at the time um, a couple of years ago when I, when I made these uh, slides. Um, and 
there seemed to be a lot of controversy in science around really the validity of this effect. Uh, to, to what extent was this really genuinely uh, present or not? So, you know, as of now, I don't really know how much of a myth versus how real this is, but it's certainly something that people have been talking about as a uh, risk, as a threat to you know, any study with human participants. Does the theory have any guidance as to when you can start to trust what the person is saying? Like when they're, I guess you could tell just based on how comfortable they are. I think so. You know, and I, I, last time I was talking about some of these mechanics of conducting an interview, all of the stuff in the beginning with establishing rapport and making people feel comfortable and whatnot, a lot of that is just to mitigate this potential threat. You know, like making people comfortable enough to produce the information you're you know hoping to get out of them. It's partly partly for this. I feel like it's definitely present in situations where the the environment that you're putting them in is much different than how you would they, they would normally be doing it in maybe not for interviews so much but like some of the fMRI studies with like writing code yep. and writing code like up and down when they're stressed okay. right that's something to worry about right right so exactly so you want to be confident that you're not seeing something else that you know, just an artifact of the environment or being observed um, when you're doing these studies. Okay, so prolonged engagement, just spend enough time collecting the data and analyzing it. Persistent observation. Is about separating relevant from irrelevant things and focusing enough or, or deeply on the things that are uh, relevant and in scope. So I guess this sort of the, uh, the complement, persistent observation is about uh, depth. You know, do you, do you ask enough questions and so on, probe enough about the thing you really care about when, when you're, when that comes up, prolonged engagement is about scope. You know, do you have enough time with participants and so on? Do you ask enough questions to really extract all the kinds of things that you, you care about? And then, you know, for, for every kind of thing, you, you go deeply enough to really get at the essence of it and, and whatnot. So you, you can see these two as complementary. Um, triangulation, another one. So here, the idea is to corroborate what you're finding, what you're learning through this qualitative analysis um, in, in other ways. It, it could be um, by having different people arrive at the same conclusion. It could be by using different sources of data. I think I have a list here. Right. So it could be the data that's triangulated, a variety of sources of data in the study. Maybe I use interviews together with emails, together with something else, you know, and, and this is a way to corroborate, to triangulate what I'm learning from one of the data from the others. Maybe it's different researchers that are doing this, right? So, you know, hopefully they can learn, they can confirm the things I'm seeing. Uh, maybe I use multiple theories to interpret the results of a study. We've actually seen, what was it? There was at least one paper a month you presented something with uh, three theories or something. Yeah, uh, I think it was, I think in that paper it was slightly different because like, I'm not sure if they were using the theories to like explain the same establish thing. the same thing. I think, I think they were using them for like different things. Okay, but you could, you could sort of see how, you know, you could use different theories to explain maybe the same phenomenon. Um, so that's, that's one way to try and do it using theory. Um, or you can use different methods, right? You can run a survey to uh, triangulate things you're learning from interviews uh, and, and whatever else. So triangulation, just more confidence that whatever you're seeing in one way can be replicated by looking at the same thing in different ways. Okay. So this is maybe, maybe the most important. 
Um, okay, this one I like a lot. Member checking, one of my favorites. Member checking is you, the researchers, after you do this analysis and interpretation, going back to the participants you studied and confirming your interpretation with them, seeing if what you're seeing makes sense also to the people that the original data came from. Okay. Here's an example. I don't remember if we read the Bogart paper, uh, I think not here. We presented, presented interviewees with both a summary and a full draft of sections four through seven, along with questions prompting them to look for correctness in areas of agreement or disagreement, i.e. fit, and any insights gained from reading about experiences of other developers and platforms. And they took literally the findings of their study and they went back to the original participants and they ran them through those participants again. And to get more confidence that they weren't seeing something that the practitioners wouldn't disagree with. One, uh, one second. One from the uh, sex workers paper, that was a great paper in terms of methodology. After we drafted the interview protocol, we hired a sex worker as a consultant to review our protocol for appropriateness and to ensure a member of the community under study was involved in the research to the extent that they desired to be involved. Consultant was paid market rate. So again, like filtering the interpretation, even the study design through the eyes of the original participants. Yeah, member checking. So what, what we are doing here is basically ask the participant if our conclusions are correct. Uh, what if the conclusions are something like uh, we talked uh, in the beginning of the class? So for example, we're going to ask them, oh, we see that you are biased. Are you biased? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. They will say no, but Right. So, you know, an easy way around this maybe is to tell them, look, people, it turns out, are biased. Obviously not you. So look, <laughs> these other people, they're all biased. You know, what do you think? Oh, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, these people are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be a way to maybe deflect attention and blame from the person themselves to kind of this amorphous thing, which is you know, the other participants. <laughs> Wait, I have a question about that. In this case, it's probably likely that one participant isn't allowed to see transcripts from other interviews yes. that you've done. So you're just kind of like checking if they agree that a bias probably exists in the world. So you know your your um your reporting probably talks about kinds of biases and maybe prevalence and whatnot, uh, and describes this um and that one person that you go back, you show this summary, right? Your interpretation, not the original transcripts. And then they can see if you know they agree or, or, or not with your your read of the situation. Yeah, I guess I just don't know, like in a study with deception, um how you would be able to do that without the person you're querying having evidence of what occurs. So you're saying the person themselves does not harbor any of these biases, therefore it would be hard for them to recognize whether these are valid or not as you're interpreting them. I'm not saying that they don't harbor any biases themselves. Um, I mean, it would it would be great if they were able to recognize that in themselves, or if they had some prior experiences that showed to them that it existed in the real world. Mm -hmm. But if like um, if the point of the study is hidden to them until you show them the results, yeah. they probably they may not have had any conception that that was something that occurred, and yeah. so they they're. Uh, approval of it might not mean much. Yes, I agree. Um, which is why I, I guess the um, on the plus side, 
studies involving deception are relatively rare. So this is, on average, unlikely to happen to you too much. Uh, most commonly, you don't do studies involving deception, I think, in our field. Um, and this won't be much of a problem. I agree with your interpretation that that's harder to do this in that case. Unless you, unless you study bias. <laughs> Just by maybe this is interesting. <laughs> okay. Member checking is very uh, useful. Look at papers, you know, as we're reading it or not. See how rarely, I challenge you, see how rarely people mention that they're doing member checking on like qualitative study papers. Okay. So easy to do, arguably, right? It doesn't take a lot more work to do this, um, you know, because you will have already written up your thing, right? You go back, uh, people will have given you their contact information and whatnot. It's very easy to, you know, have a follow up over email even with them about this. Um, but look how rarely people actually do this. Um, okay, one more transferability. Transferability is the second stop, right? What's the right after credit? Uh, oh, good job. See, this is why I wrote these down so I would avoid confusing myself. Thank you, very good. Um, yes. So transferability is basically the equivalent of generalizability. Right? To what extent do these experiences and findings transfer to a different case or a different environment? Um, so strategies to help increase this. Uh, number one, uh, provide thick descriptions, lots of quotes, right? Because then the readers and those who seek to transfer these findings can uh, judge for themselves to what extent that is possible based also on the original source because of your quotes, not just uh, your interpretation. Um, okay, so that was transferability. It's about quotes and thick descriptions. And now dependability is about the stuff we talked about earlier. You know, how logical and traceable and clearly documented was your research process to begin with? So these are things like um, leaving an excuse me, leaving an audit trail and the analytic memos and all of the stuff I talked about earlier. So audit trail. On the trail, transferability, thick descriptions, audit trail. Um, okay. okay, so here are some things that can constitute an audit trail. The raw data, okay. very obvious, you just keep the transcripts or the recordings or something like that. Um, keep the written notes you took during the interviews. Keep the survey results, you know, whatever it may be. Keep the raw data if you can, if your IRB allows this, whatever. Um, keep all of the write-ups, the field notes, the summaries, um, all of these memos that you've been writing and the notes you've been writing. Keep the code book that we talked about. You know, have one in the first place where you, you know, write down these codes, their operational definitions, and, and keep that around. Um, whatever notes that you took otherwise, materials related. For how long should we keep those things? Especially the video tapes and all of that, because probably with IRB, we don't want to keep them forever. Right? right. So, this is something you usually agree on with your IRB when you're doing this. Um, I think a common practice is to keep them for some number of years. Um, and then you promise you delete them after that. So there's something like that is what I would expect would happen. Right. And here we are saying leave the audit trail. But in theory, the video tapes will never be public, right? So mm -hmm. what's the point of having this audit trail? It's just for us? Um, yes, um, it could be, yes, it's, it's for you, it's for your research team to go back, it's maybe to um, reanalyze the data in a new way, maybe with different research questions on the same data, 
know, sometimes you can get more answers to different questions out of the same original data set. So maybe you weren't interested in those questions in the first place. You didn't look for those kinds of things. Right. So it will not serve for confirm, uh, confirmability so, because but, we'll never use them to show, okay, this was the interview. Video tapes, yes. Sometimes transcripts you can anonymize and release, right? You know, if, if you um, agree to do that with your IRB in the first place, and if you tell the participants that you'll be doing that, nobody's surprised by this. You know, that's something uh, you can sometimes do. It's release anonymized transcripts. Those can be very useful. They can be useful for other researchers kind of looking at the same data with or without the same questions. They can be useful for people like us in this class to like you know teach how to do qualitative analysis. I am reusing real transcripts from a research study, right? That somebody made available for educational purposes for this. So they could be useful for a variety of purposes um, because they're anonymized. Right? The uh, the video tape is harder. I agree. Yeah, harder to do. Okay, uh, I showed you this example before. I want to be mindful of time here. Uh, all right, one maybe thing, I'm not going to read this to you, but you can go back and look at this. Uh, from the same paper that, uh, that Courtney is the first author on that I've been giving you these examples from, this is the description of the methodology we use for analyzing this qualitative data. Um, and it's by no means the only example. I don't even know if it's a good example or the best example, but it's it is an example you could look at for how we reported on how we analyze the data. Uh, it gives you a sense of the expectation for the reporting of such an analysis. Um, there will be lots of others, including in the papers we've read last week and the papers we'll be reading next week. Um, but it's one, one more firsthand that I have experienced with that I wanted to share with you as an example. Um, okay. Mm. Yes, so we've sort of covered most of this. We didn't get to do the activity, we'll, uh, we'll do it on Tuesday. Um, but I think you have hopefully a good sense of what it takes now to do qualitative analysis in a confirmable, credible, transferable, dependable way. You will have a sense of what these terms mean and hopefully, you know, a checklist and lots of practical advice for how to do this yourself and how to report on this in your upcoming papers. On Tuesday, we will do the activity in the beginning. I have some actual transcripts. We could do some qualitative analysis in class together. Um, and Maybe we also read a uh, paper or two if we have time. So I'm going to maybe assign a couple more papers looking again for volunteers to sign up. Okay. You can also, by the way, uh, additional advice, you can go back to the three papers we read on interviews and see what they said about how they analyze the data. You know, did they do grounded theory or thematic analysis? Did they do open coding? What, what did they do from the things we talked about do they mention any of these keywords? What do they say they did to uh, address these issues and so on? So it would be useful now that you've learned about this to see how other people did this in practice. Uh, and you have at least the three examples you read in class a week ago, uh, plus the paper I shared uh, from our group uh, recently as, as another example. So at least four examples you could look at already for how people did this and reported. 